After its long run, the pair returned to their unofficial home, the Cotton Club, where one fateful day, a trio of singing beauties caught their eyes. At the trio's center was a shy 16-year-old named Dorothy Dandridge. I looked at my brother and said, look over there. <laughs> My main eye is on Dorothy Dandridge, <laughs> and I want to get a little closer to her. <laughs> and brother was the same way. Then I could say she was paying more attention to my brother, so I backed out. Because my brother and I, we never fight over women. 16-year-old Harold was deeply struck by Dorothy's vulnerability and exquisite beauty. On his best behavior, he courted her on dates chaperoned by her protective family. Dorothy was... Um... Very, uh, how can I say it? She wasn't shy, but she was, you know, quiet, so to speak. And I was the, the outspoken one. But the burgeoning relationship was put on hold in 1939. The Nicholas brothers were booked on a tour of South America, where they thrilled audiences alongside the bombshell from Brazil, Carmen Miranda. By 1941, Harold was pressing Dorothy Dandridge to set a wedding date. She was hesitant, but in the meantime, they formed a different partnership on film. In Sun Valley Serenade, starring Sonia Henney and the Glenn Miller Orchestra, the brothers were signed to dance to a new song, Chattanooga Choo Choo. At first, they hated the tune, so they convinced Fox to hire Dorothy for some extra kick. Oh, pardon me, boy. Yes, yes. Is that the Chattanooga Choo Choo? That's the Chattanooga Choo Choo. On track 29. 29. Uh huh. That's on the Tennessee line. She said the Tennessee line. Jack. She means that she can't afford. I can't afford to board a Chattanooga Choo Choo. What have you got in there? I've got my face. You say you have? Uh huh. But not a nickel to spare. Well, I do. Who who declare? You leave the Pennsylvania station about a quarter to four. Read a magazine and then you in Baltimore. Dinner in the diner. Nothing could be finer than to have your ham and eggs in Carolina. When you hear the whistle blowing ain't to the bar, then you know that Tennessee is not very far. So half the all the gold in, got to keep it rolling. Whoa, Chattanooga, there you are. Chattanooga, choo choo, there you are. Dorothy Dandridge with the Nicholas Brothers was just like putting butter on a hot biscuit chow. And that we appreciate a lot because, you know, there was very little sexuality allowed between black people in the early films. In 1941, another special woman was about to join the Nicholas entourage. While appearing in Chicago, Fayard met a beautiful college student with a quick sense of humor and sharp intellect. Her name was Geraldine Pate. Well, I was totally fascinated with his lifestyle, his experiences. He seemed so vulnerable. You wanted to immediately protect him. I think anyone's first impression of Fayard is he's probably one of the nicest human beings in the world. Now, all the time, I always thinking, I just want to be a bachelor. I didn't want to get married. I just want to meet nice little girls <laughs> and just have a ball. But Geraldine really fascinated me. So as we were leaving to get back to the theater, I said to everybody, oh, I'm going to marry that girl. <laughs> True to his word, Fayard married Jerry Pate less than a month later, in January of 1942. And eight months later, Harold followed his brother's lead when he walked down the aisle with Dorothy Dandridge. The Nicholas brothers were on top of the world, and soon they would climb even higher while struggling against barriers of race and facing family heartbreak. For Harold, life at home was also filled with tension the born lady killer was flagrantly unfaithful to his lonely wife, Dorothy. I wanted to be a big man, you know, show that I was, I wasn't just a youngster or something, you know. And I was just horrible. And I, and I loved her, you know, but I wasn't too terrible. 
Back in Los Angeles, Harold turned his energies to his two passions, golf and women. He was rarely home and spent little time with his pregnant wife. On September 1st, a pain-stricken Dorothy tried to convince Harold that their baby was on the way. But he casually dropped her off at the home of Jerry Nicholas, taking the car and leaving them stranded. Harold had pulled a little, what he called funny, and he left the keys and we thought we had the car. But we did find a man going to work and got her in, but she kept holding back. She said, Harold is gonna come, he's gonna come. But after more than 15 hours of labor, Harold was still missing. And on September 2nd at 2.42 a.m., Harold and Suzanne Nicholas was finally born. Dorothy was overjoyed, and her child's presence made Harold's absences easier to take. In April 1944, a relieved Fayard was discharged from the Army, and the following year, he became the father of a son, Tony. But like Harold, the proud father soon became an absentee parent. I tried to be a good husband and a good father. Something happened. I don't know what. But li like she said, I'm not, well, a lot of show people are not the real family type. By the age of two, Tony had begun to speak, but Harold and Dorothy's daughter, age four, could not. To their horror, the couple realized that something was seriously wrong with their child. Finally, a doctor confirmed their worst nightmare. Harolyn had irreparable brain damage. Because Daddy had held back, Lynn was denied oxygen. And that was a contributing factor. Harolyn was such a beautiful little girl. I always felt so bad about that. I don't know how my brother feels about it. He never talks about it much. I know inside he's, he's sad. He's sad about it. I didn't want to show it, you know. It's like a lot of men, even nowadays, they feel pain, but they don't want to show it. Well, we had just great times <laughs> in Europe. Uh, never thinking about prejudice or anything like that. It was all open arms. Europe became the brothers' home into the early 1950s. In London, they danced for the royal family. In Egypt, their admirers included King Farouk. Harold was especially drawn to Europe's racial climate and its women. In Europe, for me, was a uh, haven. I tried to learn the language. <laughs> Love to talk to the ladies, you know, because that's where I learned most of my languages from. In 1950, Fayard became the father of another son, Paul. But even when his wife, Jerry, joined him on tour, Fayard was far from faithful. It seems as though when I went to Europe, everything went wow. <laughs> All these beautiful girls from Italy, from France, from England, from Sweden, from Switzerland. I went wild. And my wife heard about it. <laughs> the bellboy came to the room and he said, Mr. Nicholas, the young lady that you brought along on the tour wants to know is she gonna stay in this hotel or the one across the way? And I had to translate for him. <laughs> so he took his shoe and threw, you dumb sucker. Although Jerry could stand up to her rivals, Dorothy was deeply wounded by Harold's infidelities. Their marriage was at an impasse. And in 1951, the couple divorced. Eight-year-old Lynn was placed with a caretaker as Harold withdrew into work. It ended rather bitterly. It was terrible to watch. Once back in the States, tragedy hit close to home. On September 8th, 1965, the brothers received the shattering news that Harold's ex-wife, Dorothy Dandridge, had been found dead of an apparent drug overdose. Harold suffered the loss with typical stoicism. I've never had a chance to talk to her, to tell her that I was sorry, and she died. I was really low after that. 